Hello once again from the Prim Reaper. Here we are with yet another episode of the APA Guidelines for Men and Boys. This time we'll be covering guideline number two, and I'm afraid it's much longer than the first one. Probably about double the length. Now, I don't think I have it in me to double the length of the last video, and frankly, I don't think many people would be able to sit through it. So, I'm just going to try to get through the most relevant parts, knowing that I'm often struggling to figure out which parts of this absolute dreck to cut, and which to just continue to plow through, because it's all such a relevant and stunning display of social justice mind rot. Guideline 2. Psychologists strive to recognize that boys and men integrate multiple aspects to their social identities across the lifespan. Rationale. There are multiple dimensions to identity, including age, ethnicity, gender, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, spirituality, immigration status, and ability status, and each contributes to a boy's basic sense of self and influences his behavior as he grows. Gender is one of the most fundamental of these dimensions. By the time he reaches adulthood, a man will tend to demonstrate behaviors as prescribed by his ethnicity, culture, and different constructions of masculinity. Inconsistent and contradictory messages can make the identity formation process complicated for some populations of boys and men. For instance, boys and men from racial or ethnic minority backgrounds, as well as those who are gay, bisexual, transgender, or intellectually, psychiatrically, or physically disabled may be the targets of various forms of prejudice and microaggressions. You know, I've had so many people come at me and say, regarding my criticisms of intersectionality as an ideology, that it's not just a bunch of checkboxes where people will tick off and say whether you're oppressed or not oppressed. And I feel like I have but to hold up this document and just say, Behold. I really feel like we ought to just come up with some sort of shorthand for all of these categories, so we don't need to list off 18 different minority groups as some kind of qualifier for every other sentence. How about we try, inconsistent messages can make identity formation complicated for men, belonging to many different backgrounds. See, it's easy. And then, if needed, you can go into examples after that. God, I hate to sound like I'm just nitpicking on format at this point, but as someone who has to go through and read all 36 pages of this document for you guys, let me tell you, the extra fluff added in every other paragraph, or more, gets pretty cloying after a while. I swear, by the time I'm even only up to guideline 5, I'm just going to sit here and read the whole thing verbatim and just play various sound effects for repeated varying offenses and just tally up how many slimy identity politics references we come across. One last thing before I continue. The idea of microaggressions is still one that drives me absolutely up the wall. Certainly, it's not out of the question that people can say things that other people perceive as offensive in some way, but the issue is, or should be, much more complicated than that. For example, someone's intent should make a difference. If someone is making casual conversation and asks where someone is from, I don't see why it should be seen as a personal affront. As a personal example, my eldest daughter has these crazy, intensely blue eyes, and many people regularly draw attention to them. I had a neighbor, who for their privacy, I'll just say, is a different ethnicity than us, ask me, where are you from? And to be honest, it was kind of a funny moment for me, because my jokey Prim Reaper mind went, oh my god, she just asked me where I'm from, Wee! But in context, it was a 100% innocent comment that elicited zero offense because she was just being curious about our heritage. One of the main issues with the idea of microaggressions, then, is that it throws the idea of context in the bin and puts a filter on life through which the perpetually aggrieved are looking for any comments they can find to perceive as offensive in some way, whether the original speaker meant it that way or not. You'll often see this being defended as them being vigilant or simply seeking to educate others. 
though we all know that the moment anyone asks them for details on what they're talking about, they'll wave their hand around and tell you they shouldn't have to enact the emotional labor of trying to educate you on it. A lot of it all comes back to that little thing I often like to bring up in my videos, a focus on what is within your control. A person who has their radar out, always looking for a fence, will easily be able to find it. And in all likelihood, the poor unwitting sap they ultimately point their finger at will probably have no idea what it was they said that was offensive or why. Then the offended will crumple like a wet paper bag and moan about how they have to deal with this cumulative onslaught of microaggressions coming at them at all times. Or, or, they could put down the forever offended glasses and stop taking every offhand comment so personally. They could even learn to give less of a crap about what other people say about them. It's like that last video I put out. Maybe if you'd stop thinking that all the rest of the world gives so much of a damn about you all the time, you'd stop interpreting everything as a personal attack and would feel better. Harsh? Well, maybe a little bit. But sometimes effective psychology requires a firm hand. Oh hey, speaking of psychology, we were talking about some guidelines, weren't we? Boys with feminine identities or expressions may face especially negative reactions to non-normative gender expressions, including emotional expressions such as passivity or crying, and experience strong pressure to demonstrate and conform to masculine expressions. I've already used the masculine prim getting bullied for being masculine story, so I won't repeat it. But I'll just go a little bit more broadly this time and say that people can get bullied for any number of different traits, not all of which may seem atypical or uncool. And while one kid is bullied for being a nerd because he likes to read, another may be considered well-read or intelligent. One kid, bullied for being a goth a grade or two lower than me, wound up leaning even harder into goth fashion despite the teasing, and ultimately people wound up leaving him alone because he was actually a pretty cool dude who was able to take it in stride and stay true to himself. Once again, this is not a phenomenon that is unique to men or to masculinity. Everyone must go through the process of navigating their identity, and few, if any, make it through that process totally unscathed. As a therapist, I would say that if a client mentions bullying or identity issues as being one of their primary concerns, it's probably best to ask them about the nature of those problems before making assumptions that they must be related to masculinity. Again, I'm not saying that masculinity issues might not be part of it, but we shouldn't assume offhand. Furthermore, policing of masculinity expression in boys by their caregivers tends to be ineffective and emotionally damaging to the child and creates tension in the relationship. Nonetheless, throughout childhood, boys may choose to conform to these norms rather than face disapproval. Is it me, or is this a bit of an unclear statement? I've had to sit and think on it for a little while. First of all, policing in exactly what way? I feel like we can naturally infer from the context that they're talking about what might be considered traditional masculinity, but I imagine the extent and way in which this is done differs quite substantially, not only between cultures, but even within cultures. So then, it seems odd to suggest that this policing, in the many forms it may show up in, are necessarily emotionally damaging. For example, surely telling someone to avoid expressing emotions or weakness at all costs would be more damaging than someone who takes a firm but gentle approach and tells their son that they should get their anger under control as it won't solve the problem. But both can be argued to be masculine approaches, no? And then the other word, ineffective. Frankly, in context, this is just confusing. How does one define ineffective in this case? Is masculinity policing ineffective because their sons choose to reject it and continue engaging in behaviors the parents deem to be insufficiently masculine? Because that would be what it would seem to be saying. And yet, if masculinity was considered to be such a problem, would this not be seen as a good thing? 
Or are we using ineffective to mean that the message is not presented in a clear way, and thus the boys take away the wrong message, resulting in more confused or disorganized behaviors? You see what I mean? It seems like a small and insignificant section on its face, but with critical thinking, you can really begin to pick apart this stuff and ask, what, in specific, are you claiming is the problem here? And of course, there is the follow-up question as what the ideal solution to the problem would be. If you were to answer uncritically from a social justice perspective, you might automatically think that the ideal would be to be less rigidly constrained in raising boys into specific masculinity expressions. Or if we go hardcore social justice, it might look more like eliminating traditional masculinity as a whole, but I didn't want to sound like I was strawmanning. And to be honest with you, I'm sure many of us would agree that if society as a whole could come to be more accepting of different social presentations in men, much the same way as it has for women over the last century, that would probably be an ideal thing, right? But even in their next several sections, they talk about how different cultures exert different kinds of pressure regarding masculinity, so there are some additional implications to think about there. For example, let's perform a thought experiment and envision a new family beset by social justice ideals in a very traditional culture that holds strong views of what constitutes appropriate masculine and feminine behavior, such as some African or Asian cultures. For whatever reason, this young social justice family decides they are going to raise their son in a completely non-traditional manner and support him in being emotionally expressive to engage in as many feminine activities as he likes, and to focus less on competition and success and more on personal dreams. Now, if we all lived in SJW La La Land, then this might be all well and good. But let's remember that this is real life, and this boy is still going to enter his culture with a mentality that will likely set him up for serious derision or disadvantage compared with societal expectations. So... Who is going to benefit from this alternate course of action? Even if the boy has a supposedly better relationship with his parents with less tension involved, is it fair to say that their actions didn't lead to an emotionally damaging and ineffective overall result if the child is completely unprepared to thrive in their own environment? And sure, you might get up in arms and say, but Prim, this is the American Psychological Association. So obviously, they're talking about masculinity as it relates to North American cultures. Which is all well and good. But immigrants from these cultures to American society would nevertheless face these and additional challenges as well in navigating expectations of American culture, their immediate family, and extended family that may still live in the home culture with the home culture's expectations. But in general, I'm providing this example to show that it's often not as simple as the original statement makes it out to be. The annoying thing is, or should I say, the most current of several annoying things in this document is, that they actually go on to talk about the different experiences of different cultural and other identity groups over the next several paragraphs. But I'm sure you're shocked to hear that it talks primarily about racism and heterosexism rather than the kinds of influences I'm referencing. Go figure. Jesus Christ, I'm two paragraphs into this thing and I'm already four pages into my script. Like I said, the next few paragraphs are mostly just identity politicking, but I'd like to briefly explore some points they make in their section on older adults. To their credit, they do make some valid points, such as going over the significance of loss of work roles on one's identity, the transition to retirement, and the significance of prior military involvement. But then we get into statements like this. Sexual and gender minority persons adhering to rigid masculinity ideologies may have a more difficult time transitioning into older age, since an array of factors influence socialized gender roles at this developmental stage. For example, as older sexual and gender minority individuals leave the workforce, they face significant concerns about independence and financial resources. Uh, forgive me if I'm missing something plainly obvious here, but... 
exactly why would older sexual minority men have more difficulty with independence and financial resources? Finally, adherence to rigid masculinity norms for aging gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender non-conforming persons has been correlated with higher incidence of self-destructive behaviors, e.g. substance use, unprotected sex, physical and mental health problems, e.g. depression, suicide, neglecting medical needs, and fears of not being able to express their male identity due to dementia or being misgendered after death. <sighs> I feel like there is a lot, a lot, that could be said about this sentence. For the sake of keeping it brief, I will say two things. One, Having both personally experienced dementia through family loss and also studied the subject in quite significant detail for my licensing exam, I would posit that perhaps most clients beginning to experience that very thing might have a few other more pressing concerns on their mind. Again, not to assume, but just from what I have seen. Two. These are supposed to be general psychological guidelines for working with boys and men, right? It feels odd to me to include such vanishingly small and specific examples like this in what is supposed to be a general set of guidelines. I mean, I guess it's better to be aware of as many possibilities as you can, but... Eh? Anyway, so now I'm going to move into the application section, though in the interests of time I'm going to try to go through these in a bit more of a shotgun manner, focusing on the initial sections of each paragraph. Application. Psychologists strive to understand the important role of identity formation to the psychological well-being of boys and men, and attempt to help them recognize and integrate all aspects of their identities throughout the lifespan. Okay, this is pretty sensible. Not a bad start, as long as you're doing so in a neutral and unbiased manner. Psychologists look to understand the impact of military service over the lifespan of men. Again, very sensible. For many men, this represents a significant and relevant aspect of their masculinity. Psychologists strive to understand that some racial and ethnic minority boys and men may not have had opportunities to learn about specific aspects of their family's heritage. Therefore, acquiring knowledge about their previously unacknowledged groups may offer opportunities to discover additional aspects of their identities or dispel negative and or unrealistic images that society has promoted about those reference groups. Psychologists also strive to reduce and counter the damaging effects of microaggressions by teaching boys and men from historically marginalized backgrounds skills to cope with racism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, ageism, ableism, and other forms of discrimination. Uh, just as I thought they were going to start to be reasonable about all this. Before I respond, I'll just include the next one because it's related. Psychologists working with boys and men strive to become educated about the history and cultural practices of diverse identities, to understand how these practices relate to racial, ethnic, and cultural identities, to have awareness of how masculinity is conceptualized in these groups, and to communicate this understanding and integrate it into meaningful therapeutic interactions, such as participating in cultural ceremonies and becoming integrated into their clients' respective communities. Now, I want to be very clear here. I think that it is very wise to try, as much as is feasible, to have a general understanding of different cultural backgrounds and how these may impact your clients regardless of gender. This can not only provide relevant background and insight, but it can help you to guide your own practice to be more effective and to avoid making a cultural faux pas. I do think that, unless you are a very specific kind of counsellor, going to such extents as becoming integrated into their clients' respective communities is going a little in the extreme. However, by focusing primarily on these identity points, or on things like racism, homophobia, etc., you run the risk of making a whole lot of assumptions about someone else's experiences 
and spending time talking about things that they may not prefer to focus on. Again, if the client specifies any of this as something they wish to talk about, then of course, by all means. But these are not assumptions to bring into the room before even introducing yourselves. Psychologists strive to become aware of and eradicate any biases they have toward boys and men from historically marginalized groups and to recognize value conflicts they may have with their servants' recipients. Hmm, yes, that would seem like a good thing to be aware of, wouldn't it? And last but not least, psychologists also strive to work to address the unique relational needs of gay, bisexual, and transgender boys within the family and peer context. Again, a reasonable thing to be aware of, as long as we are not making assumptions. Whew. Gosh, I'm sorry, that was a lot. I feel like there were some valid points in this section, but as always, they were all buried in social justice caveats that needlessly complicate things and run the risk of pushing therapists seeking guidance from this document into making assumptions. Ugh. Pulling myself through this stuff is challenging, because after a while it all gets to be pretty samey, if I'm being honest. You just know that no matter what, every section is going to devolve into apologism for different, smaller identity groups to the point where it just feels like the focus on men is actually the secondary concern. Oh well, I've made a commitment to this project and I'm gonna get through it. Eventually. Thanks so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next one.